when Time Warner merges with Turner Broadcasting, that requires major restructuring. You're putting two huge corporations together. And there's going to be overlap. There may even be some units that don't fit with what they want to do. And you need to then take a look at organizational structure. Which design makes the most sense for this new mega organization? So today as we talk about organizational structure, the metaphor that I'd like you to keep in mind is architecture, building, designing a structure that makes the most sense for whatever the function is that's going to take place in that building. And similarly, we want to design organizations so that the structure of the organization makes the most sense for whatever the major business is of that organization. So what is this organizational structural stuff? First, it consists of division. It's the way the organization divides up the tasks and the responsibilities for those tasks. And then having divided those up into what presumably makes the most reasonable sense for the business at hand, the way it then coordinates activities between those tasks. This is graphically represented on something called the organizational chart. And we'll take a look at some models of organizational charts a little bit later on during today's session. But the organizational chart, and I'm hoping that you've all seen one at one time or another, the one that starts with the CEO at the top, and then the vice presidents, and then the various functional area vice presidents uh, arrayed and departments and such under that, is this graphic representation of how the tasks are divided up and who reports to whom the various layers of authority that exist within the organization. And why do we need to go through all of this and why do we need to study all of this? Well, if you think about it, <coughs> Even the simplest business, the simplest organization, requires some formalization about who does what. Even in groups, if you're trying to accomplish some goal, you need to know who does what, who does the shopping, who does the cooking, who sets the table, who does the dishes, because for one, you don't want duplication of effort. That would be inefficient. And the second thing is you don't want some tasks to fall through the cracks so that everybody stands around and looks at each other at the end of the day and say, says, how come this didn't get accomplished? Not good for a business to let things fall through the cracks like that. You lose customers. Uh, very ineffective way of operating. So the need to study organizational structure and come up with this rational type of design what are some of the features that we need to pay attention to? If we go to the first overhead, basic characteristics of organizational structure. Major thing is division of labor. How are the many tasks that need to get done in an organization divided up into specialized jobs? The advantage of division of labor is that it allows for specialization to take place. It allows for the development of expertise. You learn from experience. People gain experience in certain areas. And they become specialized. The narrowing of that task domain, the narrower it gets within an organization, means the more experts you can have in an organization. The one caveat or the one caution in this sort of thing is that as people become so expert in their area, that's good. But are they still able to communicate to other people in the organization so that you can get the coordination done, you can get the tasks accomplished? All too often, for instance, we see that people who are involved in computer services and management information systems sometimes start talking their own jargon. And so we hear about GUI interfaces, and we're not talking about somebody who has chocolate smeared on their face. Although somebody who's a novice in this area and never heard of it 
might actually conjure up an image like that. And so the need to, as you become specialized in your area, we come back to things we talked about communication, not getting so specialized that you can't communicate anymore. You're fine with the shortcuts when you talk to your colleagues, but you're going to also sometimes need to communicate to people outside who are starting from step one, where's the switch? How do I turn this thing on? So division of labor. The broader the tasks are that somebody has to accomplish, the more the person is a generalist. They just can't become a specialist in any one area. They have good perspective. Of course, they're missing on that specialized expertise. The second aspect of this is the hierarchy of authority. The various levels in an organization of authority, or management levels, if you will. And here we're talking about the power that one person has over another person to hold that person accountable for getting a job done. Position power that we talked about before, legitimate power. If we distinguish in organizations the different levels of authority, one of the terms that's commonly used is tall versus flat organizations in terms of hierarchy. The tall organization has many levels of authority. And typically, the larger, the more mature the organization, the more we're going to find a lot of layers of authority, because they keep expanding. And as they expand, they need to bring in more people, more managers, more need to coordinate. The fewer levels of authority, the flatter the organization. And you actually see that on an organizational chart. Easier to get from the very person at the bottom to the very person at the top. And this is going to be more typical of younger organizations, less mature organizations. As they start up, there are just not going to be as many people there. As the hierarchy grows, so does the need for communication. And so does the problems of communication. Again, if you keep in mind that tall organization, lots of layers of authority, lots of management from the bottom to the top, you can begin to actually visualize what can happen to communication as it filters its way up the organization, something that we talked about before. More chance for things to slow down. Obviously, it has to go through more people. And more chance for distortion as it filters through people's perceptions of what the problem really is that they're conveying upwards, or what the message really is. And similarly, the same problem's coming down. So that as organizations have more layers of hierarchy, we can anticipate that there has to be more attention to the communication issue. It gets to be a problem. OK, and as I mentioned before, how does this all relate to size? Smaller organizations typically have fewer layers of authority. Yet another building block in structure is something that we call span of control. How many people actually report in to a supervisor. And how large should this be? Is one size better than any other size? Mm -hmm. At one time, there was kind of a prescriptive approach to organizational design and structure with the thought that there shouldn't be too many people reporting into any one supervisor, maybe 10 or 12, because the supervisor simply doesn't have time to attend to all those individuals. A large group is too large to supervise. But today, we see things vastly different in organizations. And the number of people report in really depends on the nature of the task being done. Is it something that requires the expertise of the supervisor in terms of uh, getting information to various people and coordinating? You can't have too many in that case. Or is the nature of the task something where the supervisor can more or less back off and be more of the coach type of supervisor? It also depends on the knowledge, skills, experience, and abilities of the employees. Newer employees require more supervision. And <coughs> as you bring new units and new products online, you may require also more supervision. The more professional they are, the more they're self-motivated and self-starters, the more you can have reporting to you. 
And so we now have units where many people report in to one individual. You can have spans of 30 or 40 people reporting into a manager. A lot to manage, yes. But you're also going to be managing differently. You're not going to be looking at people's individual behavior. You're going to say, send me your spreadsheet. I want to see the results. And so in that sense, you'll have more time because you don't have to spend as much time on what each individual, but you do have to spend time on what their results are and coordinating that. So that varies in terms of span of control. And yet another aspect that we need to take a look at is that of line versus staff positions. Line positions are those in which the people involved are actually mm. somehow producing or making decisions about the main goods and service that the organization is producing. And we'll see that again when we look at some of the charts that we're looking at. Staff people make recommendations. They're adjunct to what's going on. And examples of staff positions as opposed to line positions, line positions are typically in production, okay, reporting up to <laughs> vice presidents and et cetera. It's a clear line up to the CEO, would be legal services in an organization, not directly involved in the production of something. Human resources, for many years, was considered to be a staff position because these people were not involved in production. They were making recommendations about who should be hired and how performance appraisal should be done in organizations. However, that unit today has often moved into a line position because getting the right people in the organization and doing accurate performance appraisals, holding people accountable, is seen as being so important to the organization. So it varies where you see the human resources division, uh, depending on how the strategy is conceived in that organization. So line and staff positions often become blurred. If you think about it, again, a good I think conceptualization is to think of the President of the United States. Okay, the next person in a line position is the Vice President of the United States. And then, Reporting to the president are all those cabinet officers. Does the president have a lot of staff? You bet. All kinds of chiefs of staff that help regulate calendars of who comes in to see the president and coordinates uh, meetings for the president and makes recommendations to the president. All of those are staff positions. So recommendations versus direct production. And the last of the building blocks that we are going to consider is decentralization. This is the extent to which a decision is made out at the periphery, in which case it's decentralized, or it's made in, at, at central headquarters, in which case we say that it's centralized. We used to call this centralization, but there is so much decentralization on that the terminology has flipped these days. Decentralization brings all the benefits that we associate with greater participation. Okay? And the decision gets moved much closer to those who have to implement it. So whatever could be the downside of decentralization, sometimes the person who has the best perspective in terms of making the decision is somebody who is in the center of the organization. And so, and, and the other reason is for keeping some sense of control of what's going on in the organization. We're talking about finances. Somebody wants to have a hand on what's happening out there in terms of the various costs that are being incurred. You might want that decision somewhat more centralized if it's a large expenditure, smaller expenditures you can decentralize, but you may need to centralize that large expenditure figure. You can't let people have their hand at spending 
thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on what it is in an organization. So you may need to centralize some of the decisions for information and control. OK, so we've looked at the various building blocks. Now, how do we put these together in terms of organizations? OK, if we can come off that, I want to hold functional structure for a bit. Come off that for just a minute, because I want to first describe simple structure before we get to functional structure. The simplest of organizations, the very simplest, we call simple structure. What is the simple structure? It's the mom and pop organization. It's the organization where somebody is chief cook and bottle washer. Where there may, in fact, be some specialization in terms of division of labor. You have family working the organization, and you've assigned a few tasks to one person and a few other tasks to somebody else. But these people are going to need to be flexible. And so at one minute, you may be st stocking the shelves. And the next minute, you may be thinking about, well, what kind of poster should you draw up to advertise a sale that's going on? In that case, you're in marketing, sales and marketing. OK, simple structures. People are doing multiple types of jobs. And there is no real division of labor going on, no real specialization. But as an organization grows, you can't be the chief cook and bottle washer anymore. You have to give up that bottle washing and hire somebody to do that as you hang on to your chief cook job. And now you're going to need somebody to keep the books. You're going to need somebody to do accounting. And so you move to the next more complex of organizations. And now we can go to functional structure. OK, the functional structure. And here, the major tasks of the organizations are broken down into units. Manufacturing, sales, research and design, accounting and finance. Some examples of major functional areas in an organization. And people will specialize within each of these areas. Things are now grouped in a way that seems to make sense. The advantage of such a grouping is that it certainly allows for efficiency. People become specialized. People become expert. It allows you to focus on certain areas and hold people accountable in those areas. It allows for good communication within any one area. As people become specialized, they can focus on uh, the particular problems and the resources that are needed for that area. So a common view of what needs to be done in a particular area. The disadvantage, and the thing that you always need to think about, is what we call isolation of units. Okay, You need to then focus on ways to coordinate among units, to get information from one unit to the next, because what good is manufacturing if there are no sales? Okay, and what good are sales if people aren't billing it accurately, accounting and finance? Okay, so you need to have good coordination between all of this and make sure that units don't get isolated from each other so they're not communicating and not getting information there in a timely way. And also that the units always keep the organizational goals in focus. It's easy, as you become involved in any one unit, to think of your own problems and think of your problems as paramount and lose perspective of where you fit in in terms of the grand picture. And so organizations are just going to evolve this way as they become bigger and more complex. And these are things that you just need to keep working at. <coughs> as organizations continue to grow, there is a movement towards something called product structure. Product structure lays another division on top of functional structure. And you move to this as you get engaged in producing more products in an organization. General Motors, Chevrolet division, Oldsmobile division, large truck division. We can go on about that. Each of those divisions are product divisions. And we can do the same thing in lots of other large organizations. Split them apart in terms of the products that they're doing. 
And you need to do that as organizations get more complex and add on more products, because you need to focus directly on the needs of that product and the customers that you're serving. So you add all of this on. It also adds some flexibility. You can tailor what you're doing in the functional areas to the product, the particular marketing to that product, the particular manufacturing to that product. And what then we have in mind is that one size does not fit all. We need flexibility. We need diverse approaches for different types of products. The disadvantage in all of this comes in that economies of scale get threatened. You lose out on what you could save on because you're such a large organization. And there may be inefficiency because you now are really duplicating efforts that you don't necessarily have to duplicate. Maybe there are things in manufacturing that you could share across different products or things in engineering that you could share across different products. And so you need to become aware of where you can cut down on certain things because you're duplicating efforts far too much. So sharing resources, communicating better, making sure that you're not working at cross purposes, and that people in one sector of the organization know what's going on in another sector of the organization. I mean, you may wind up with products competing with each other. Maybe you want to do that because one of the products isn't capturing a share of the market that another product could capture. And you need to come up with something similar. But then you want to be careful that you don't uh, actually have these two products in the same organization competing for the same customers. Now you're cutting into what could be a uh, profit-making area because you're wasting resources. An example, a product I don't see on the shelf anymore. Procter & Gamble at one time had two decaffeinated coffees. One was Sanka. We're all familiar with that. But there was another product called Brim. Brim came out because Sanka was thought to be a fuddy-duddy type of product, something your grandmother had, but something that young, dynamic, energetic people wouldn't bother with. And yet, they, Procter & Gamble thought that there was a segment of the market to be captured because people were getting concerned with the amount of caffeine that they were taking. They just didn't want Sanka. So they came up with this other product, Brim, which was marketed directly towards younger people. It lasted for a while, okay? But apparently they had too many product lines out on the market. The one that we see out there all over the place now is Sanka. The one we don't see is Brim. The one that had stronger product recognition was Sanka. And so Sanka is not for your grandmother anymore. Everybody apparently feels comfortable if they want decaffeinated coffee using something like Sanka. Um, okay, so product lines. There are other ways of structuring. Yet another way is using market structure. Now you divide up the tasks and responsibilities, but you're doing it in terms of the types of customers that you're catering to. So it could be corporate customers versus individual customers. And within that, sales specifically to corporate customers to allow them to build up the expertise and the kinds of contacts they would need for selling to a corporation, and the kinds of service that a corporation would be looking for, and individual sales to a totally different segment of the market. One of the areas where you see this fairly prominently is Bell Atlantic which markets two different types of classified or yellow pages. There is the B2B, marketed towards businesses, and sales specifically targeted to that area. And then, of course, the ones that we get with our regular white pages, as it were, in this area. It's interesting that we don't have a lot of other companies coming in competing in terms of telephone directories because other parts of the country do. There are uh, other organizations that come in and produce telephone directories to compete with whatever the local one is. Bell Atlantic seems to have the market all sewn up. 
but different types of um, market structures. And there is yet another type, and that would be geographic structure. The differentiation here is in various regions. And the advantage to dividing up the organizational structure of building blocks into various regions is, particularly in sales, different regions have different tastes. And you need to cater to the tastes of the region. Large department stores are very often divided up into regional areas. So Macy's, which is one of the nationwide department stores, would stock different things in Florida than they would stock in New Hampshire. And so you need this kind of regional structure to make sure that you're satisfying customer demands in the various areas. Um, we don't have, do we have anything in regional supermarkets? I mean, national supermarkets. Not too many. A&P used to be national. Uh, we're probably going to have mergers so that we will get to national areas. There are some that are larger than others. And again, food tastes differ by region. And so you would have that divided up into a regional structure as well so that you make sure that you're catering to the food tastes of the South versus the Southwest versus the Northwest versus New England versus Mid-Atlantic. Regional structures make sense. Again, sales and service vary. And for both market and geographic structures, you come up with the same types of advantages that you come up with in product structure in that you're developing a certain expertise, that you're moving the solutions closer to where the issues arise. And you need to just make sure in all of this as you add more layers onto the organization, which is what you're doing with these, with these more complicated designs, that you're keeping communication lines fluid throughout the organization so one sector knows what the other is doing and you can share resources and you can share information across various types of divisions. So these are some of the more familiar types of structures that are used. And there is yet one more, far more complicated, called a matrix structure. Sometimes called a simultaneous structure because it imposes two types of structures on top of each other. Each of the diamonds that you have there represents an individual who is reporting to two people. This superimposes a product design on top of a functional design. And it allows for cross-functional teams to develop. You don't have this going throughout the whole organization, but you might have it going through part of the organization, uh, such as engineering, perhaps. Um, or product development. You have it going through part of the organization, so you can draw on the expertise of multiple functional areas as you're trying to bring out new products. So functional and product operating simultaneously. And those people are reporting to two bosses. They as they report to a project or a product team leader or team director, they're also reporting to their functional area manager. Makes for complications, can, make, can also make for chaos to a certain extent. For the individual, looks fine on paper. For the individual, it could become problematic. The individual is probably spending more time with the project leader or the team leader. The problem then comes for the individual reporting back to the functional manager when it comes time for pay increases and promotion. The functional manager is the one who is typically responsible for making those decisions. And the functional manager needs to be kept abreast, needs to be made aware of all of the things that this individual has been doing in terms of contributing to the organization. 
because the functional manager isn't going to be observing so much what's going on. So you need to make sure that problems don't arise here so that careers of individuals are not disrupted in dealing with the matrix organization. So what are the advantages? It presents a very flexible type of organization where you need to have fast product development, where product life cycle is something that is rapid and evolving, where competition is fierce, and where technology is complicated. Obviously, it sounds as if I'm talking about Silicon Valley or any of the high technology types of industries, and that certainly is the case. That's where you're more likely to find a matrix organization. In computer industries, where there's rapid product life cycle, in telecommunication industries, where there is rapid product life cycle, in biotechnologies, again, the need for flexibility in terms of development and cutting across different areas, different functional areas, to draw in multiple expertise and multiple perspective as to how we can get this product out there faster and design it in such a way that our customers are going to be interested in it. It's going to meet the needs of our customers. And so you don't use the old way of product design where you start with R&T and then move it to product development and then move it to engineering and then move it to manufacturing and, and then bring in marketing. You may need to bring in marketing from the very beginning. You probably need to bring in marketing from the very beginning. You need the people in engineering and R&D talking right up front as to how they're going to move this out quickly into a usable product. IBM had research laboratories in upstate New York in, the, in Dutchess County area, the Thomas Watson Research Laboratories. And for years, these were research laboratories which lavished resources on world-class scholars and researchers in the area. They could research any topic they wanted to. But things have changed. <laughs> and those resources are no longer available and no more pursuing the interest of your dreams. Now the pursuit is in terms of product development and moving things more rapidly to market. How is this going to pay off for IBM in the shorter future, not somewhere out in infinity or the long run? And while there is value to that, Industry is thinking that it no longer can invest in those kinds of things. It will have to be government and academia, which will do that kind of research. And they're going to be much more product oriented. And um, in fact, they've come up with a few new designs which are presumably going to revolutionize some kinds of things. Which brings us, as we're talking about IBM, to the last of the organizational structures that I want to talk about. And that is the virtual organization. We can come off integration for a minute. I moved ahead one too fast. Good. Um, the virtual organization is not a real organization, like virtual reality. It is an apparent organization. And it's an organization that is developed from other organizations contributing resources to a specific problem area that needs some type of solution. What would be an example? It would be an example of IBM and Oracle and Sun Microsystems um, and uh, some of the other big names out there in computers minus Microsoft coming together and thinking about alternatives to the Intel Microsoft type of product that we get today. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're contributing resources in various areas and thinking about how the internet is going to have a big impact on how computing is going to be done in the future. 
and maybe PCs will be obsolete. What we're going to need to do somehow is plug into the internet and we'll be able to do everything via the internet. And it will be a whole lot cheaper for everybody as well. And so what will become obsolete are all those operating systems and all those microprocessors that are out there. And so these organizations are engaging in this and they're doing it each for their own competitive advantages as they share resources in this area. The virtual organization tackling for competitive reasons for all of these people because they see two organizations that right now are kind of monopolizing the computer market. Intel with its microprocessors and Microsoft with its operating systems. And people are looking to develop new products to make room and develop, develop markets for themselves. So the virtual organization or organizations that pool their resources to develop what will be standards in something as an area, for instance, high definition TV. And so we have the Sonys and the Panasonics cooperating with Lucent and um, AT&T in terms of looking for ways of developing this whole new area called high definition TV. It's supposed to be much better than what we have as TV and the need to come up with standards so that when they make a TV, the broadcasters will be able to broadcast to similar types of TVs. You won't need uh, different TVs for different broadcasters out there. There have to be standards in this area in order for it to work. And so in fact, they did pool together their resources and they did come up with standards for high definition TV. Now we're in the old chicken versus egg problem. Uh, these sets are going to be very expensive to begin with, and the manufacturers don't want to start making them until they're sure the broadcasters are going to have programming out there, and the broadcasters don't want to start programming until they're sure that there will be TVs there at reasonable prices that people will buy. So uh, hopefully we'll see high-definition TV here sometime before 2010. Uh, I don't think we're going to see it much in this century. Uh, they've got some time, although they're supposed to be getting stuff out by 1999. I think it's going to take a bit longer. OK, we've been talking about dividing up organizations into various different units. And we've looked at a number of ways that they can be divided up, from functional divisions to product divisions to market divisions to geographic divisions. Having done all that dividing up, there has to be some way to begin to tie these organizations together, to begin to integrate these organizations into some coherent functioning unit. And now, if we go to the overhead, integration. What are the ways that this can be done? Through hierarchy of authority, and we'll come back and we'll look at each of these, through liaison roles, through teams, committees, task forces, um, through standardization and formalization. Different ways to integrate the various units of the organization. Hierarchy of authority. Two new units out there, easy. We'll appoint a new manager, a new layer of uh, hierarchy to bring the two units together. So this person is in the integrating position. Uh, the product manager, the product vice president over all the functional areas is the integrating position for all those functional areas. That person has direct contact with the various units, also has direct responsibility for those units, and has to make sure that information and products flow smoothly from one unit to the next. Even if this person is not directly responsible for actually moving the information or the product from one unit to the next, it has to make sure that ultimately the job gets done. Lower down the organization, the first line supervisor is in an integrating role and a level of hierarchy within the organization. 
the first line supervisor has to make sure that whatever is the product within that operating unit or the task or the service within the operating unit, that the job gets done. And has to make sure that Harry is talking to Sally, is talking to Joe, so they know where they are at various stages of projects. And things get done in a timely way. Uh, product management and person management. When is the job going to get done? Tom so that Joe can start work on it. That's integrating. That's coordinating. There are liaison roles. And these are people who have specific roles in various areas of the organization that, again, have to be in contact with other people. And sometimes the contact in liaison roles are outside the organization. The buyer for the organization is going to have to coordinate, has a liaison role between what are the needs within the organization, what do we need in terms of various resources, and who do I contact out there as a provider or a vendor for what we need. A liaison role in terms of integrating things that need to be done in the organization. A reference librarian. In a school like NJIT, may again provide a liaison role for specific discipline areas. How are we going to make sure that we're up to date in all the books that we need and all the journals that we need for an area? One of the librarians will then have the responsibility of being in touch with the faculty in that discipline, a liaison role integrating what needs to be done so the tasks within that library can be accomplished. So liaison roles in organizations can be within, but very often it's a role that functions externally to the organization as well. Teams, committees, tasks, whatever you want to call them. In this case, we're talking about either permanent or temporary groups that are set up to deal with issues that come up at a particular time. If it's product development, and we're talking about a product, product development teams, those teams could be in place for a long time as they deal with products. And they deal with not only version one of the product, but they deal with version two, version three, version four, version five, version six, version seven. It goes on and on as we think about software and how it gets updated over the years, as an example. Um, but there are also temporary groups which come together to deal with arising problems until it gets entrenched somewhere in the organization. Example from NJIT, an example from this classroom. Distance learning is something that is growing in all institutions of higher education, and it's relatively new. It's relatively new in terms of merging technologies as a way of delivering with the content area. And so in order to make sure that you put out the best product in terms of distance learning, you need to cut across a lot of sections. You need to have people who are the discipline experts or the faculty working with people who are the technology experts in terms of what becomes the best delivery. And because it goes outside the boundaries of the campus, you need people who are also going to deal with delivery of this product outside. How do we get it to the people that we need? Very often that comes under the aegis of something like continuing education, which traditionally has marketed courses to outside the campus area. And so in order to have this operating effectively and making sure that we're not putting out there what I would like to call the electronic correspondence course, you know those things that you saw on uh, matchbook covers you can learn to draw in 15 easy lessons or something like that? We want to make sure that that's not happening, that we're putting out a reputable product. You need then, as it starts up and as you run into various problems, you need to anticipate problems, you put together then a committee, a task force, across different areas to deal with this issue, coordination. It begins to coordinate things. And once 
Uh, it is well developed and underway. It probably takes its own house somewhere within the organization. But startup, it starts out as a committee. Standardization and formalization, yet another way of doing things. When you don't have time, when you're dealing in a large organization, uh, and where things are fairly standard, you can coordinate things by saying we have rules. This is how people are going to do it. And we know how people are going to do it. Standardization of the task uh, at McDonald's. There's no room for discretion in terms of how many French fries go into an envelope. They've got it all standardized. People know what they have to do. And so that helps coordination. Or standardization of forms that have to be filled out in terms of transmitting information. At the end of a shift in a hospital, nurses have to transmit information from their shift to the nurses who are coming on duty. And it has to be done in a structured kind of way. You can't count on nurses bumping into each other and saying, oh, you know, patient in uh, room 7, bed 9 had, you know, this event happen today. You have to have a formalized way. And so there are end of report forms that nurses need to fill out so that the oncoming nurses can have this information. You're coordinating across shifts and you're coordinating information that people need to have. Or the patient chart itself becomes an integrating mechanism so that as different people come along, they can look at the chart and see what's been written on it and see what's been prescribed for people and see how conditions change. Because today, you don't always have the same doctor coming in and looking at you. You're lucky if you do these days. It's whoever happens to be on duty. So uh, standardization and formalization acts as yet another mechanism. OK, having looked at all of these various mechanisms, we can then begin to consider that certain types of uh, aspects of structure seem to go together with others more typically. And we come up with two major types of organizational designs, a mechanistic design and an organic design. The mechanistic design is typically one that is tall in structure, that is characterized by lots of division of labor, that has centralization of authority, that um, has formalization in function. Think of, if you will, a General Motors, a General Electric, a Westinghouse. Okay, a mature organization. And this organization works best under stable conditions. On the other hand, the organic organization is one that is characterized by fewer levels of authority. It's typically flat. The decision making is decentralized. It's a flexible organization. And this works best in dynamic conditions, conditions where there is a lot of change and where the technology is complex. So two different types of organizations. And if we summarize on these, we can look at the various types of dimensions and see how they vary for organic and mechanistic organizations. The span of control is wide on organic and narrow on mechanistic. The authority, the levels of authority, are few on organic and many on mechanistic. Low formalization, low centralization, low position power, all on organic. But all of these are high on mechanistic, the type of power that is prevalent in an organic organization would be expert power. People rely less on the formality of the position for arguing their points and getting things done and rely much more on their knowledge, their expertise in an area. So that less formality in these organic organizations. Not one organizational design for all organizations, but the organizational design, how you put it together, depends on 
what is the business process in that organization? What is the product that you're trying to get out? If it's stable, if conditions are invariant, mechanistic works fairly well. And what we'll also see as we move along things into next time is that in a very large organization, you will have multiple types of organizational design. So manufacturing typically works well with mechanistic designs. But research and development typically needs organic designs, large organizations, multiple designs. What makes for effectiveness in organizations? That's the whole point of studying all of this business in organizational structure because we want to understand ultimately what makes for an effective, productive organization. How do we know an organization is effective? Well, typically you think of, OK, bottom line. And true, that's one of the characteristics we look at. We look at output. We look at profit and cost. We look at stock prices. We look at the quality of the product that it puts out. Are there a lot of government recalls on the product or not? We look at productivity in that organization specific to that organization, and you look at growth. Is it an organization that is expanding? Is it expanding at a reasonable rate? Is it overexpanding? Something to be cautious about. Or is it declining and contracting? But there are other output, uh, other approaches as well besides output. The internal process approach takes a look at what's happening to human resources within an organization. What can we say about worker motivation, worker loyalty, turnover, absenteeism, the number of strikes that are going on in that organization, the number of grievances that are filed, the safety record of that organization. That's another area where you look for signals of the effectiveness of an organization. And you typically think the less the absenteeism, the less the turnover, the more loyal workers are, the better the safety record, the more effective an organization you have. And yet, there are other approaches. So there are multiple ways of doing this. A systems approach, which looks at the ability of a firm to obtain the resources it needs, both in terms of material, product resources. Is it getting? If it's in oil drilling, is it able to go out and secure new fields for drilling in oil? And the other part of it is human resources. Is it able to obtain the quality personnel it needs, the knowledge that it needs, in order to get the job done? Or is it having problems staffing organizations? And it's not getting the information that it needs. And finally, the stakeholder approach. This approach tells us something about the satisfactions of people, the various groups who have a stake in the organization. Surely the employees are a group, as well as the owners of the organization, which are the stockholders, if it's large, or the board of directors. But there are also customers, and how satisfied are they with the product that's coming out and the service that they're getting. And the community at large in which an organization operates. How satisfied is that organization? Are they going to let an organization expand? Or is the organization there kind of seen as the enemy? We don't want this organization, not in our backyard. Get it out of here. Hostile relationships with the community at large. And so organizations work on their public profile all the time and want to be seen in positive kinds of ways by organizations. And they do this by sponsoring things on public television and sponsoring the Olympics and sponsoring other kinds of events out there, making themselves good neighbors in the community. How does all of this link together with structure, effectiveness and structure? Well, let's take size as an example, size and structure. And then we'll look at how size relates to effectiveness. 
The larger the organization, the more complex it's likely to be, the more differentiated it's likely to be. Interestingly, the more decentralized it's likely to be, because if it's a large organization, the CEO can't make all the decisions. They have to be decentralized out there. And the more formalized it's likely to be. How does this relate to any individual who's working in the organization? The more decentralized the organization is, the more likely the person is going to be satisfied. So we begin to think, oh, OK, large organizations, people should be more satisfied. Not necessarily the case, because on the other hand, formalization leads to more dissatisfaction. So the relationship between size and satisfaction in an organization is not straightforward and is more likely to depend on the size of the unit. And again, we go back to the professional orientation of the workers and some other factors which we can toss in from what we know about job satisfaction as well. If the span of control is too small or too large, workers are not happy. If it's too large, you feel depersonalized. You can't ever get to your boss. If it's too small, your boss may have the tendency to be on top of you. You don't get much room to make decisions on your own. So the important thing as we look at structure and how it relates to individuals in the organization is, again, making sure that you have a rational structure that fits with the individuals who are working there and it may have to change over time and probably will, uh, and that it fits with the product or the service that you're delivering. What this leads us to is really where we're going to be headed next time as we get to see the complexities in which organizations operate. How many external units do they have to be concerned with? What is the technology that they have to be concerned with? All of these have an impact ultimately on the way you design the organization. So where have we been and where are we going? Today we looked at characteristics of the organization. We looked at differentiation and coordination, mechanistic and organic designs, and ultimately organizational effectiveness. Where this leads us next time is the natural segue into looking at how technology affects structure, looking at how complexity affects structure, and looking at how organizational culture affects the structure of the organization, and ultimately its effectiveness. All next time.